All right, so structure number one, okay? What's this big kind of empty looking thing here in the middle of the cell? Water vacuole. Okay, and I will accept for the function of that something like supports the cell, uses turgor pressure, keeps the shape of the cell, something along those lines for the function would be acceptable. Okay. I just said that. Supports the cell, keeps the shape of the cell, turgor pressure. Any one of those is fine. Number two, this structure here that does not have the little dots would be the smooth ER. Okay, functions of the smooth ER, any one of the following, breaks down complex carbohydrates, makes lipids, repairs membranes, um, detoxifies poisons, okay, something along those lines. Okay, so number three then is its counterpart, the rough ER. Okay, the rough ER makes hormones, transports proteins, okay, things like that. Okay, number four outside of this big thing is the nuclear membrane. Okay, the nuclear membrane basically controls entry to the nucleus, okay, prevents things from getting into the nucleus, okay, allows stuff out of the nucleus. Uh, I will accept envelope, but I, it's not one of the terms I gave you. It is one term that is used for that, though. Okay. All right, number five, the dot inside of this big structure is the nucleolus. Spelling counts on this one. Okay, nucleolus. Okay, it's got two L's, right? Um, and the job of the nucleolus is to control protein synthesis, okay, and copy DNA. I'll accept either one. Okay, number eight, okay, and the structure up here near the top, Golgi apparatus. Okay, controls the excretion of wastes, packages wastes, okay, something along those lines. Okay, number eight, spelling counts on this one, nucleus. Okay, nucleus holds the DNA. Okay, number 10, okay, the kind of sausage shaped structure. Nope. Mitochondria. Plants don't have lysosomes. Okay, mitochondria burns sugar for energy, carries out cellular respiration, okay, something along those lines. Okay, number 11 is pointing at the space within the cell, which we call the cytoplasm. And what's the job of the cytoplasm? Okay, we said keeps everything in place was not a function the last time we had a quiz. It's about transportation, facilitating diffusion. Okay, would be the best answer you could write, would be facilitates diffusion. Okay, the little dots are the ribosomes. Ribosomes make protein. Okay. Number 13, I will accept anything having to do with the cytoskeleton. So microtubules, microfibers, microfilaments, okay, something along those lines, okay, cytoskeleton um, supports shape of the cell. Again, no, cell's not mobile. Okay, and number 14, green thing, chloroplasts. Okay, photosynthesis would be about all you'd need to write beside that one. Okay, number 15, the very outside of a plant cell is the cell wall. Okay, 
function of the cell wall keeps the shape of the cell. It's the frame of the cell. Okay, support the cell. Number 16 then, just inside of that, is the cell membrane. Exocytosis and endocytosis are the words that should be there for the function. Questions on any of those? All right, so that one, we did 14 of them, right? Because we had two that weren't there. So it's out of 28. Okay, give them a mark out of 28. Let them see it. And then put them right here on this desk in front of Sierra. Okay. Okay, so we're, we're done talking about cells by themselves. Now we're looking at cells as part of a larger organism. Okay, so everything we talk about from here on out is going to involve whole organisms with lots of cooperating, interacting, and even specialized groups of cells. Right? What we're going to focus on today is how did multicellularity come about? Okay, why are there multicellular organisms? Okay, how did it evolve? We'll talk a little bit about evolution and what you've learned in religion class. It's one of those few days as a science teacher where I, I get to do a little bit of that of the uh, religion stuff. I don't get to do that very often. Okay, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that, and you'll find that what you learned in religion class is not at odds with what you learn in science. People seem to think the two can't get along, but in actual fact, they get along famously. Okay, um, Pope Francis, he's a scientist, actually. Okay, And uh, he's had a lot to say about the relationship between uh, religion and science and, and how they don't need to be at odds with each other. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, so we gotta look at how multicellularity evolved, Okay, the role of specialization in multicellularity, Okay, and we'll look at plants as an example of a multicellular organism. That's what we'll be focused on mostly. You do animals and systems and animals in biology 20 and 30. Okay, so like next year, I think you look at the digestive system and you look at the circulatory system in bio 20. So you'll start looking at animal systems. We're gonna look at plants because it's a little simpler. Okay, all right. So multicellular organisms, how long do you suppose they've been around? Well, which would have come along first, single-celled or multi-celled? Single-celled, okay? And in fact, for billions of years, there was nothing on Earth, and then there would have been some single-celled organisms, and then billions of years after that, okay, there would have been multicellular organisms. Becoming multicellular is a big step, evolutionarily speaking, okay? Um, so there had to be some advantage to that, okay? How many people know how natural selection and evolution work? Okay, so just quick review here, okay? Evolution and natural selection are not the same thing. A lot of people confuse them as the same thing. Natural selection is the mechanism through which evolution happens, okay? Natural selection is the thing that selects um, a certain trait or a genetic trait that you might have. So if I'm a wolf and I'm in a pack of wolves and I have the best eyesight, I'm probably going to catch more prey than other wolves. Okay? And as a result, I'm probably going to be stronger. And as a result, I might pass my genes on or reproduce more often than the wolves that are weak. Okay? It's following me there. So good eyesight, the gene for it, is likely to be passed on to the offspring of the next generation. So more of the wolves in the next generation will have good eyesight as opposed to poor eyesight. Okay? Things, that are, things that work well or provide an advantage are selected for. Over the course of time, and I don't mean like 10 years, okay? I mean over the course of like hundreds or thousands of years or sometimes even more than that, these small selections result in a change in the species as a whole, all right? So um, if you ever look at like the evolution of the horse, okay, they, at the Terrell Museum, they have a great display of the evolution of the horse, okay? The ancient ancestor of the horse is this tiny little thing about the size of like a miniature schnauzer, okay? It's a really small thing that kind of looks like a deer, okay? But it's really, really small, okay? And over the course of time, certain traits were selected for. That would have been, it went from having actual toes to having a hoof, Okay, it went from being quite small to being large and having a broad back, okay, with strong running muscles, okay, things like that that would have been selected for because as you get bigger, fewer things prey on you. If you're small, lots of things can eat you. Being big, 
less things eat you. Okay, so size was selected for um, strength of the of the foot being a hoof as opposed to toes was selected for. Okay, because that made them faster or able to grip better. Um, having you know the ability to sleep standing up. Okay, have you ever seen like horses? Horses and cows sleep standing up. Okay. Well, sometimes they lay down, but they can actually sleep standing up. They have a little structure that goes down into the knee and holds the knee locked, and they can actually be asleep while standing up. It's pretty cool. That's, that's where cow tipping comes from. Not that you should ever do that. Okay? Yeah, they, they're asleep. You come over and you push them and they fall down. I don't know why that's fun, but it, yeah. No, most of the time they wake up before you push them over. People get this idea that cows are easy to tip over. Cows are heavy. They're really heavy, and they are not easy to push over. Not that I've ever done that. Okay? Um, so yeah, these kind of things are, they can be, these traits can be selected for by nature. Now, there, there does oftentimes come a time when, you know, nature has been selecting for this, for this, for this, for this, for this, and we see a trend, and then all of a sudden that organism disappears. Okay, if we're looking at the fossil record, suddenly that organism just vanishes. Something big happened. And all that stuff that had been selected for for thousands of years was no longer advantageous. That, that species dies out, goes extinct. Okay? And then we see branches of them surviving instead. Okay? Nature starts selecting for those things. But there are some things that over the course of, of time have been selected for all the way along. Now, so that, that change in the species is evolution. Over the course of thousands to millions of years, we might see that it almost looks like one organism changes into another. In the fossil record, it looks like that. It looks like this organism became that one, but it's not the case. Those two organisms are usually separated by at least thousands of years, if not more. Okay, everyone follow me on that. It's not like what you see in cartoons where, you know, you see the, the thing crawl out of the ocean and then turn into something else and then turn into something else. That organism cannot change. It has these genes. Its offspring could be different. Their offspring could be different, okay? But this is not X-Men. You cannot mutate and become something else, okay? That's not how it works. Okay, so that's how natural selection and evolution work. In the past, it has always been thought that that idea is counter to what the church says, okay? The church says that, you know, God created everything. He did, Okay? Science is probably not going to argue that. If you talk to some of the, the kind of the greatest minds in science, they, they are often very faith-filled people. Okay? They understand that at some point, the math of how the earth and how the universe created breaks down and becomes only possible for God okay, to do. Okay? It just becomes actually that complex. Um, but what we've been, always been told is that we can't have this idea of evolution because God, was, God created everything. Well, yes, he did, but he's a smart guy. He had to know that changes were going to occur on what he created. Okay? He knew the earth wasn't going to stay the same. Things were going to happen to the earth. Okay? He needed to give the stuff he put on the earth the ability to adapt so that it didn't die off. I mean, did some things that he created die off? Yes. Okay? Certainly. Okay? But that's kind of the course through which the earth was kind of being prepared, right? We can look at it that way. I mean, it does say in the Bible, you know, on the first thing that God did was let there be light. Well, the Big Bang, I would have to assume, would have been pretty bright, okay? A fairly large event, okay? Had to have been pretty bright, okay? If we look at it on a more simplistic scale, the first thing to form in our solar system would have been the sun, actually. The sun would have formed first, Okay? And then after that, the planets coalesced. That would have separated the sky okay, from the Earth. And then the, you know, after the Earth cooled off, the seas and the land would have been separated from each other. It goes in the same order. Okay? The scientific way that we know the Earth evolved goes in exactly the same order the Bible says it all happened. All right? So the two ideas actually go very well with each other. As long as you're okay with the idea that Genesis isn't meant to be taken as literal truth. Okay? If you can... If you can if you can accept that lots of times in the Bible, um, things are written as like a, an analogy, okay, or a metaphor, okay, things like that, um, that's, that's essentially what we're saying. Imagine the time the Bible was written. If you came around and told the people in Jesus' time that, hey, by the way, the earth is four and a half billion years old, and that, you know, the sun coalesced from this cloud of gases, and it got compressed by gravity to the point where atoms were forced together in nuclear fusion, and that got hot, and that was how the sun was born. You would have had rocks thrown at you until you were dead. 
That's stoning, by the way. That's how they would kill heretics, okay, back in the day. Because people at that time lived a very different lifestyle than we do, okay? They were a, they were a subsistence people. That means from day to day, their main concern was, how do I get enough food to live, okay? They didn't have time for things like learning how to read, okay, going to school, things like that. There wasn't education and, and stuff like that. It was basically, I got to teach my kids to fend for themselves so that they can find enough food to stay alive. Okay? It was a very different time. We now have it much easier. So we have more time to broaden our horizons and discover things. Okay? So you have to imagine that at the time, they needed to have an ex a, a way to write down what really happened scientifically in a way that would be acceptable to people of the time. Okay? Seven days was a sacred amount of time for people. Okay, there was the Sabbath day, right, where you rested, and then and there were the other days of the week where you worked. Okay, um, and so they made an analogy of seven days. Okay, now could God have done all of this in seven days? If he wanted to, he's God. He could have done whatever he wanted. Okay, but he had to know that over the course of time the earth was going to change and it would prepare the way for the final creation on the sixth day, which was us. Yeah. Okay, is man basically the last thing to appear in the fossil record? Yes. Okay, it all still goes along just fine with that idea. Okay, so they're not the mortal enemies everyone says they are. Okay, they actually get along and, and have a lot of things in common, at least with the flow. Okay, the time scale, yes. Okay, we have to understand that seven days is an analogy for four and a half billion years. Okay, that's just the way it is. Now, if you're a fundamentalist and that's a person who takes the Bible as literal truth, you'll hate everything I say. Okay. I don't apologize for that. I'm telling you what Pope Francis says. He's our guy, so we got to go with what he says. He's also really good. You guys are very lucky. You have you're going to grow up having a great pope. Okay, um, you know not everyone was that lucky. Sometimes they were just really old guys who kind of stayed in the Vatican and didn't do anything. Okay, Pope Francis is not that guy. Those, are, those people would be fundamentalists. The people who think the earth is only 5,000 years old are the people who believe in the literal truth of the Bible. The time scale of the Bible is only about 5,000 years if you follow it. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, from, you, can't, I mean, you can't knock some people's beliefs. If that's what they believe, that's what they believe. There is just so much evidence that that's not the truth. Okay? And, and Pope Francis has said lots of times, many parts of the Bible are not meant to be taken literally. Okay? I mean, look at Jesus himself. He talked, about, he talked in parables all the time. Okay? Was there really a prodigal son? No, it was a story that he told to illustrate a point. Right? Okay? Those kinds of things. And some of the parts of the Bible we're meant to take literally. Okay? There is a lot of the stuff in there that we are meant to take literally, but there's lots of stuff that's figurative. Okay? All right. So, multicellularity has evolved many different times, okay? It's evolved in different groups of organisms, okay? We know that early on, according to the fossil record, the first organisms to appear were essentially blue-green algae, okay, which is a photosynthetic type of bacteria, really. They were able to live in the oceans, okay, uh, convert sunlight and uh, carbon dioxide, etc., to oxygen and glucose. Okay, they were the first photosynthetic organisms. They could use the raw materials that were available. Okay, um, as time went on, there were branches from that. Okay, as more raw materials were being produced, other types of organisms appeared that could fill the niches. You guys, remember what a niche is? Some people say niche. It's not it's niche. Okay. Uh, anyway, besides pronunciation. Okay, niche is the job that that an organism does or the space that it fills. Well. As certain organisms produce things, their waste products essentially become resources for other organisms. Okay? The waste products of plants are the resources for all the chemoheterotrophs like ourselves, fungus, animals, okay, stuff like that. Okay? So other groups of organisms would start to appear. Okay? Some of them went extinct, some of them persevered. Okay? Uh, and so that's why we have now essentially the different branches okay, of the tree. But all of the branches of the tree originated from single-celled ancestors. All right? Multicellularity evolved in plants, it evolved in animals, it evolved in fungus, all separately. Okay? Those are the three multicellular groups of animals. Okay? Everyone follow there. Now, early on, multicellularity wasn't true multicellularity. There's a difference between um, being a colony of cells 
and being truly multicellular. If you're a colony of cells, all the cells are the same. Okay? Every cell in there is identical. You're basically just a bunch of single-celled organisms that live together okay, for mutual advantage. If you're multicellular, the cells are all different, and they're dependent on each other. Some of them are specialized to do certain things, and that specialization is the thing that separates a true multicellular organism from a colony. Okay? So that's specialization. Right? These cells do this job, and maybe they are unable to do another job. Okay? Now they're unable to do that, so they're dependent on these cells to provide them with that. Okay? There becomes this interdependency in a multicellular organism. Right? Okay, so here's kind of the time scale okay, of, our, of our planet. Okay? 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth formed. Okay? Before that, the Sun was busy forming. The Earth wasn't even around yet. Okay? So if we go back like about oh, six and a half billion years, our solar system would have just been a cloud of interstellar debris and dust and gas. Okay? A lot of that gas was drawn towards the middle of the solar system. Okay? It became the sun. It all it gathered all the hydrogen, basically almost all of the hydrogen. Okay? Went into that one place. It got so big and so heavy that it crushed it under gravity and ignited nuclear fusion. There was so much force, so much gravity, so much mass that it can force hydrogen atoms together. Okay? We talked about that in chemistry, right? nuclear fusion. Okay? You force the atoms together, you get helium and a whole whack of energy. Okay? Tons of it. That's how the, a star is born. Okay? Once that happened, there was still a lot of debris hanging around in, in the solar system. Okay? And that started a period of time called the early heavy bombardment, okay? which is basically when the planets formed. All this stuff is hanging around and it's smashing into each other. Well, when things smash into each other, they don't just break. They get hot. And usually that melting results in a lot of the stuff sticking together. And things get bigger and bigger and bigger. This takes a long time, billions of years. Okay? By around 4.6 billion years ago, okay, Earth is a reasonably sized, solid, semi-solid chunk of rock. Okay? It's not as big as, well, it's actually around the size it is now, maybe slightly smaller. Okay? Um, and gravity's pulling in all this stuff. That's 4 billion years ago. It's still kind of molten. There's, not, there's no life. Okay, there's no life around at that point. Okay, you go forward almost another full billion years, so from 4.6 to 3.9 billion years, okay, the Earth is cooled enough that the gases surrounding it are condensing and they're forming liquid water, rain is happening. The atmosphere is much different than it is now. It's mostly carbon dioxide, ammonia, okay, things like that. It's poisonous, okay, but it's there. Okay? Oceans begin to form on the Earth's surface, life appears. The first uh, evidence that we have of life in the fossil record is between 3.9 and 3.6 billion years old. Right? So the Earth had to hang around for a billion years before life could even begin to appear. Right? Everybody with me so far? All right. So those organisms, they were photosynthetic cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. Okay? For about another billion years, that's all there was. Okay? These simple things. Now you see this blue line here? Okay. This blue line, its thickness represents the amount and diversity of living things on Earth. Okay. So you can see that very early on, it's very thin. There were not very many different kinds of organisms on Earth. Okay. So photosynthesizing bacteria are pumping huge amounts of oxygen into the atmosphere. That's good and bad. It's good for the things that are coming along, but it's bad for the things that are there right now. Well, it's not that they'll run out of CO2. It's that oxygen is toxic to them. It's a waste product. And so there reached a tipping point in early Earth's atmosphere when oxygen built up to the point where it became toxic for at least half of the organisms living on the planet. And that was the first kind of mass extinction okay, that Earth experienced. The organisms poisoned themselves with their own waste products. Not that they did it on purpose, not like we're doing, okay? Like we're, you know, polluting and poisoning the earth. This is just their waste products built up to the point where they couldn't tolerate it anymore. Now, some of them could. They continued to thrive, okay? They, their offspring evolved and filled the niches that were vacated by the organisms that were destroyed, okay? Now, that's going to lead to slightly more complex single-celled organisms. Okay. Now, we go ahead here another half a billion years or so. Oxygen is continuing to build. We have large single-celled organisms appearing, and our first multicellular organisms appear okay. two billion years ago. So for more than 
half of Earth's lifetime, there were no multicellular organisms. Okay? They, are, they count for less than half of the Earth's life. Okay, fast forward about another billion years. Once you have multicellular organisms, look what happens to the thickness of this line. It gets fatter quick. Okay? Because once you get multicellular organisms, you get a lot more diversity. Okay? There's a lot more potential for mutation and change and, and things like that. And because they're more complex, they can fill niches that maybe weren't filled before. They can go to places that other organisms could not survive, like they could leave the ocean. Okay? Single-celled organisms don't do well if they're just open to the air, open to the atmosphere. They've got to be in water and things like that so they don't dry up. Okay? Becoming multicellular allowed for those kinds of changes. Now, obviously, still, at this point, a billion years ago, there isn't anything living on land yet. Okay? We're still talking about all life on Earth still being in the ocean. Okay? But we can see that about a billion years ago, we had what they call the Cambrian explosion. Okay? The diversity of life just took off because that's when the first animals appear. The first multicellular animals appear about a billion years ago. Okay? Now, can you imagine if you are something that can eat plants? Plants have been around for like two and a half billion years. There's probably lots of them. Okay? If you have the ability to consume other organisms, there's lots of food for you. And that's why there was this sudden explosion in diversity. Okay? Now, does that mean there weren't things along the way that caused major setbacks? There were. Okay? There were all kinds of things that caused major setbacks. Okay? The studies have shown that you know, Earth got hit several times in its history by large interstellar objects. Okay? Asteroids, comets, whatever. Okay? Those caused mass extinctions. There's actually some evidence to say that... Um, the, uh, the Earth experienced almost 90% of all life being exterminated at one point, okay? And that's thought to have been caused by a nearby supernova having its radiation strike the Earth and essentially almost sterilize it, okay? There's lots of things that went on that provided setbacks. That goes back to this idea that, hey, God's a smart guy. He knew his creation was not going to be static and unchanging. He knew it had to be dynamic. He knew these organisms that he put on there had to be able to change and adapt. as often now? Well, there's a lot less of them now. Early on, when Earth was forming, Earth was formed by the fact that there was lots of stuff out there smashing into each other. Okay? In fact, the formation of the moon was caused by a Mars-sized object slamming into Earth. Okay? It was part of the Earth at one time, yes. Okay? Um, so what happened early on in Earth's history, we're talking like four billion years ago or so, okay? about a Mars-sized object that happened to cross Earth's path smashed into the Earth. But it wasn't a like head-to-head -head crash, it was kind of a glancing hit, but it was close enough that both of the objects were li essentially liquefied by the intensity of the crash. Okay? What happened was a whole bunch of debris from Earth's surface was scraped or blown off, and it entered a kind of a cloud that was in orbit around the Earth, and it coalesced into the moon. Okay? That's why the Earth is now a little bigger as well. The core of that object became part of the Earth. Okay? But the surface of the Earth was almost stripped off by the impact, okay? and that formed the moon. The, the evidence we have that that's true is that the, what the moon is made out of is the same stuff the surface of the Earth is made out of, but not the mantle and core. Okay? Earth has an, a solid or a liquid iron core. Okay? The moon, by comparison, is much less dense. It's much lighter. Okay? Not, because, not just because it's smaller, but because it's made of mostly the surface material from the Earth as opposed to the core material of the Earth. All right? But they've done, with the rocks they brought back from the moon, okay, they've done the, the kind of comparisons. They know they're about the same age. They know they're about the same composition. Okay. Yes, it is still, the universe is still expanding. Yes, that is true. Uh, we know that because um, we can look at the light from other stars and we know that they're moving away, right? Especially in very distant stars we know are, are moving away from us, which says the universe is still expanding. Yes. Okay, so back to this diagram here, okay? We get our, our first animals and things really take off, okay? We get all kinds of things. Now, again, guys, this is, okay, we're looking here. This is the pre-Cambrian, Cambrian boundary, 540 million years ago. This is about the point where plants begin to colonize land. Okay? Around 500 million years ago or so is about when plants began to colonize land 
that started what was called the Carboniferous period, okay, where the Earth's surface became covered in plants because there were basically no animals on the surface of the Earth, on the land part anyway, that could eat them, so they just thrived. But that is, of course, where we get now all of our coal from. Okay? The plants that lived during that time have become the coal, oil, and gas deposits that we're now harvesting. Okay? 500 million years for that to happen. Okay? About 100 million years after, after plants get onto land, we start seeing some of the first evidence that animals begin to move onto land, which again caused another explosion in diversity because, hey, if you could move on to land, you had a basically inexhaustible source of food and no one to eat you. Okay? So you know, being on land was a pretty safe thing if you could get out there. All right? takes a long time. It's not a quick process. It's not the snap of a finger that it looks like when you look at the fossil record. Okay, you have to remember that you know two rock layers that might be adjacent to each other in 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 the fossil record could be separated by millions of years. Okay, okay. so what distinguishes a multicellular organism from a colony of cells is division of labor. Okay, the other word we use for that. Specialization. Okay, this is a colony of cells. This is not a multicellular organism because every one of the cells in that colony are identical. Okay, there isn't a cell in that in that uh, colony that does this job, another cell that does just this job. They all do all the jobs. They cooperate. Okay, there's a certain advantage in that, but there isn't any specialization. Okay. So it's important to know that that's the distinction okay, between them. All right, so essentially what happened is as, as we get these colonies, some cells within those colonies have things happen to them, mutations, and they, are, they become slightly different than the other cells. That's what led to the specialization. Okay? Some of them had a mutation that allowed them to do certain things better than the other cells. And the other cells kind of made up for what they could no longer do. And that led to the first true multicellular organisms. Okay? So we got cellular specialization and division of labor. Again, that's, that's come up again here. Okay? Colonial aggregates, all cells did all the jobs. Okay? Cells, uh, as cells in the colony tend to become increasingly interdependent, some of the cells Okay, start doing jobs alone. All right. um, yeah. So the Earth, obviously, early on, a okay, lot more volcanic activity on Earth early on. Crust was thinner. Okay. I mean, as the Earth is cooling, right? as it cools, the, the crust can become thicker, continental plates build up, right? things get subducted and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, also, the Earth's getting hit more often by stuff. Okay. There was more debris out in the, out in the uh, solar system. Earth got struck a lot more often. That's why we have things like the early heavy bombardment, the late heavy bombardment. Okay. Those are periods of time where the Earth got hit by lots of stuff. Okay. Now things are a little bit more stable. Don't take that for granted. But okay. um, Here's the other thing. Look at this picture. Look, why does the moon look so big? It was way closer. Okay. The, the moon is getting further away all the time. It is slowly spiraling away from the Earth because of the way it was formed. It was formed by an impact with the Earth. So about every year, it gets about two centimeters further away. Okay? Well, not in a, not in a frame of time that will matter to us. Okay? But it is getting further and further away. Not, not a lot, but it's, it is. Eventually... It'll go far enough away that it could fly off. Probably not before our sun swells up and devours the Earth anyway. But okay, it is moving away from us ever so slowly. Okay. Okay. Don't. Worry. It's going to be. It's billions of years away. It's not your concern. Yeah. Good for you then. <laughs> if you become immortal, yeah. Good for you. Yeah, I, I don't even know if the human race will still be around by that time. Okay, we probably will have moved elsewhere by then. Because actually, sometimes it is closer. The Earth, the, the Moon's orbit isn't perfectly circular. Okay, it's um. So if you've got, you've got here's the here's the Earth, here's the Moon, and and the Sun's over here. Obviously not to scale. Okay, but um. 
as the as the Earth as the Earth circles the Sun, okay, um, the Earth's orbit also isn't perfectly circular. It's somewhat elliptical. So it's not a perfect basketball, but it's not a football either. Okay, but it's not perfectly circular. But what happens is, as the moon goes around the Earth, the Earth pulls on it. But so does the sun. So when the moon comes over here, it gets pulled towards the sun. Okay, and then when it goes over here, right, it gets pulled a little closer to the Earth. So it's always moving closer, further, closer, further. But on average, it's going about two centimeters a year further away. Okay, so the Earth in its orbit actually wobbles back and forth quite a bit because of the moon, right? When the moon is here, it pulls the earth a little ways away from the sun. When the moon's over here, it pulls the earth a little closer to the sun. So the earth wobbles back and forth all the time, okay? Well, it's just, it's essentially, it's just bleached, right? Like, because there's no uh, gases or, because you know, it's in a vacuum, has no atmosphere, there's nothing there to cause changes in the, in the color of it, right? I mean, if you took, you look at Mars, like it's pretty uniformly red, okay, based on what kind of stuff is there and what kind of gases react with it. So Mercury is the same color as the moon, right? It's just blasted gray. Okay. So what we're going to look at now are examples, and a lot of this stuff will appear on your unit exam. Okay, examples of specialized cells within a plant. Okay, so we're going to look at a plant now, and we're going to say, okay, there's these cells that do this job, these cells that do this job, these cells that do this job. You've looked at these already. In the cell anatomy lab, when you looked at the, the leaf in cross-section, you actually saw different types of plant cells within the leaf. Okay, we're going to look at that in a little more detail, and the structure of the leaf is something you're definitely going to be tested on from two perspectives. One from a specialization and multicellular organism perspective, and one from a plant has specialized tissues that need to do certain things perspective. So it's it's big. It'll be tested a lot. An unspecialized cell does not have a specific job, usually. It does everything. It carries out the basic functions of the organism. Well, with, you're not going to find many. Yeah, a colony would be all unspecialized cells. A plant is not that. Okay. All right. So the thing we're going to start out with in the plant, oddly enough, when we're talking about specialization, is the cells in the plant that aren't specialized. That's how they're specialized. Okay. They're what we call parenchyma or stem cells. How many people have heard the term stem cells before? Okay. That's right. Or I want to. Yeah. Get stem, if, if I get stem cells injected into my knee, my knee will regrow cartilage. Yeah. And then I won't be a decrepit old cripple. Right? Okay. So a plant okay, has these cells called stem cells. This is, a, this is essentially where the term stem cells came from. Okay? These cells are often found in the buds that are on the stem of a plant. Because those, those buds need to become different kinds of cells. Okay? Some of them need to become leaf cells. Some of them need to become cells that transport uh, water and nutrients. Some of them need to become cells that support the plant. All those cells look different. Okay? So a plant has to have unspecialized cells that have the ability to become specialized cells of any type. Okay? And that's the beauty of stem cells, is that stem cells are unspecialized until they receive a chemical signal that says, you need to become this kind of cell. And they do. All right. Everybody kind of follow me there? All right. So stem cells that come from, uh, from like an adult, okay, so a fully grown person like ourselves, okay, if we take stem cells from our body, there's only a certain amount of things that they can become. Okay. They can't become just anything. Embryonic stem cells, on the other hand, can become anything. Okay. So the kind of stem cells that you take from an embryo or developing fetus, a baby, okay, that's still that's not been born yet, they can become anything. All right, and I think we talked about this before, right? That this is that's that's the the problem that the church has with stem cell research is you have to take the embryo and kill it, okay? Because you're going to take cells from it that were going to become a liver, brain, a stomach, a spinal cord, okay, whatever, right? If you take those cells, they'll become. You can grow that tissue. 
Okay, they're, they're stem cells like that. Okay, making sense? All right, so that's what parenchyma cells do. They're unspecialized. They have very thin cell walls because they don't need to support anything really. They haven't become anything yet, okay? They can carry out most of the cell's basic metabolic functions, but that's mostly just so that they can survive long enough to receive a chemical signal that tells them you need to become a palisade layer cell. You need to become a stomate cell. You need to do this, okay? All right. Some cells within the plant will become part of what we call the xylem, which is the part of the plant that conducts water from the roots to the leaves. Yes, the tubes, okay? There's two sets of tubes, sugar and water, right? Okay, so these ones typically have a tapered shape because they need to create a tight seal, but that's also fairly supportive because they're usually gonna be in like the middle of the plant, and so they're going to have a supportive function as well, okay, and they're going to conduct the water, okay. There are other ones that carry the sugars. They have a, kind of a wider, they're kind of wider, okay, and they, uh, they'll transport the sugars and stuff down, okay, so they carry thicker sap, okay. There's xylem sap that's really thin, it's mostly water, and then there's the sticky stuff that we encounter most often. That's the stuff that has the sugar in it, okay. All right. So the food conducting cells, that's what we just talked about here, they're a little bit bigger, okay? They carry the sugary sap that's obviously a lot thicker and more viscous, okay? They also have specialized little structures in them called sieve plates, Brandon, okay? Sieve plates, which essentially, uh, when, when you have that thick sap with the sugar in it, sometimes sugar will crystallize. If that crystal continues to grow, it'll eventually block the tube, and you don't want that. So there's these plates, and when the crystals encounter the, the plates, the weight of the sap above crushes the crystal, and then that keeps it from getting too big and building up and blocking the tube. So that's what these plates will do. They're a specialized cell that keeps them from getting blocked. Okay. All right, leaf structure. This is super important, okay? This is specialized cells within the plant that do a certain job. I'm gonna ask you about the layers of a, of a plant's leaf, okay? Because these are examples of this cell does this job, this cell does this job. It's an example of specialization and multicellularity. So this is what you looked at through the microscope the other day, this picture on the right, okay? These are the palisade cells, these ones here near the top, okay? They're all pretty rectangular and very densely packed and they're always on the top of the leaf. What do you suppose their job is? Nope, not protection, not strength. Catch sunlight. These are the photosynthetic cells of the plant. The palisade layer is densely packed. These have more chloroplasts in them than other cells. Look how dark, like they're, they're much darker in color than the cells on the bottom of the leaf because the bottom of the leaf is always in the shade. The top of the leaf is the part that catches the sun. So this is where all the photosynthesis takes place, in this palisade layer. Way more chloroplasts, way closer together, okay? Their structure is uh, like the palisade rock formation. That's, why, that's where they get their name from, okay? Tightly packed columns of cells, okay? Underneath that, okay, we can even see in here that part of one of the veins that would have the xylem, the water carrying tubes and the phloem, okay, is in there. And we can see that down here we got all these kind of irregularly shaped cells, okay? This is what we call the spongy layer, okay? The spongy layer holds water and allows for the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen to take place, okay? Can it carry out some photosynthesis? Sure, okay? That's not its primary job. Its primary job is to create spaces between the cells that could hold water and gas. No, okay? Now, other layers to the leaf, okay? This top layer here, okay? This top layer above the palisade layer, you see all these kind of oval or circular shaped cells, okay? This is what we call the epidermis, okay? And the epidermis is like skin, that's, okay? We have an outer layer, we call it the epidermis as well. Its job is to secrete a protective layer of wax over the entire surface of the leaf. If you've ever noticed, when water hits a leaf, it beads, and then it kind of runs off. The leaf, the leaf doesn't absorb any water, okay? The water can only be transported there. It doesn't get absorbed through the leaf, unless you're looking at a moss, but that's different. We're talking about a multicellular vascular plant here. Well, I mean, if you rubbed a leaf between your fingers, some of it would probably come off on your fingers. 
Yes, but shoes generally have a wax or polish put on them to be that way anyway. <laughs> Grab some leaves and rub them on your shoes. <laughs> I don't want to tell you. Okay. Okay. So is everyone following me here? These cells here, but notice that they're almost transparent. They need to allow light to get through to the palisade layer below, but they've got to secrete this stuff that prevents water from evaporating. Okay? The whole purpose of having that waxy layer, which we call the cuticle, okay, is to prevent water from evaporating from the leaf. Okay? If it's allowed to evaporate from everywhere, all plants would be like a moss. If you put a moss in the sun within an hour, it's a crunchy mess. Okay? It just dries right out. Plants don't do that. Plants only have a few small openings and they're all on the bottom of the leaf that allow evaporation to occur. And the plant has some ability to open and close those holes okay, and control the amount of water that evaporates out of the plant. Everyone follow? Okay. So leaf structure. Okay. Uh, photosynthesis occurs okay, in the mesophyll cells. We're going to change that. Okay. We're going to say palisade. Okay, in the palisade cell, that's these top cells here, okay, which contain chloroplasts. Okay, we got palisade layer, and then we got the spongy layer underneath. Okay, okay, and in the spongy layer, there's lots of spaces there, like I said, that hold water and gas. So if you look at the diagram here on the left, okay, you can see the palisade layer is very uniform, column-like, but underneath the cells are kind of random in shape, and there are big gaps in between them okay, that can hold water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. On the bottom layer of the epidermis, which also secretes a cuticle, there are these little holes. The little holes are made of specialized cells called guard cells. Okay? Two guard cells make up a stomate. The stomates are like pores. They can open and close and allow water to evaporate out. Okay? And we're going to look at how that works because the guard cells are another example of a specialized cell that does basically only one job. Okay, so will you need to know these layers? Yes, you will. Waxy cuticle, upper epidermis, palisade layer, spongy layer, okay, all that stuff. You're definitely going to need to know that and what each layer does. Palisade layer, lots of chloroplasts specialized for photosynthesis. Spongy layer, random shapes, create spaces that hold water and carbon dioxide. Okay, so substances enter and leave the leaf by two routes. Veins and stomates. So veins bring water and nutrients up to the leaf. Those water, or sorry, that water will evaporate out through the stomates. The nutrients will get used up. Okay. The other way that stuff leaves the leaf is again through the veins. Once the sugar is produced, it goes in the phloem veins, which go back down to the roots. Okay. Yes, certainly some of the sugar that's produced in the leaf stays in the leaf and gets used here, but a lot of it needs to go to the roots. Why do the roots need sugar? Right, and they can't carry out photosynthesis. Roots can't carry out photosynthesis. Why? Right, they're underground. There's no water there. There's no light there. There's lots of water, but no light. So, okay, they have to be fed by the leaves. Okay, similarly, the leaves cannot absorb water. They have to be fed the water by the roots. Okay, so they're, they're working together there. All right. Now, the stomates, the guard cells, okay, these openings that are specialized cells that control the rate of evaporation. Okay? This is going to tie a couple of concepts together for us. How many people remember us talking about osmosis the other day? Okay. Osmosis is the process that allows plants to not only transport water from the roots to the leaves, but also control how much water is allowed to evaporate out of the stomates. Okay? So early on in the morning, when the plant has had basically all night out of the sun to absorb water, Okay, the cells, the guard cells that make up these stomates get full of water. Their water vacuoles get really, really full. They get so full, in fact, that it pushes on the cell walls and makes them assume this shape. They get shaped kind of like a hot dog. Okay, right? And what that does is, because they bend, it creates an opening. Now, throughout the day, as the sun, as the sun is hitting the plant's leaves and it's carrying out photosynthesis and water is evaporating, okay, Water evaporates out of the surrounding cells, and then as a result, salt concentrations build up in the cells around the stomate. So, since there's more salt here than there is here, water begins to move out of the stomates 
or sorry, out of the guard cells and into surrounding cells. As a result, the shape of these cells changes until the stomate is closed. Okay? It's not something the plant actively controls. It doesn't think about it. It's like, ooh, man, it's starting to get hot. We should close the stomates. It doesn't do that. Okay? It's simply a reaction that happens as a result of water leaving the plant. Okay? That creates a salty situation okay? that then has water moving by osmosis to balance the salt. Okay? We get salt over here. Okay, salt outside, water moves across the membrane by osmosis to balance the salt. That closes the stomate by osmosis. You must be able to explain that process to me on a unit exam. Okay, because it, it brings in cellular transport, specialization, multicellularity. Three concepts, one idea. Okay, they're all coming together here. All right. So this is what guard cells and stomates look like under a microscope. Okay? They're very much like the diagram there. Okay? Here's the two guard cells, these two red ones. Right? And these cells around it are the ones that would lose water and then have salt concentrations build up. Water moves from the guard cells out to those, and that closes the stomates. All right, give you guys a few minutes, answer those questions, and then we'll go over them together. Okay. So question number one is pretty important. It's not something I covered directly. It was something you guys were supposed to kind of come up with a reason for. Why would being multicellular be such a huge advantage over being unicellular? Carson. Okay, you're probably a bit more adaptable for sure. Okay, it also has something to do with what we looked at yesterday. Right. It allows you to become big. Multicellular organisms can become way bigger than single-celled organisms. That's what we looked at yesterday. Multi-micro versus macro and, and micro. Okay. If I become multicellular, I overcome the surface area to volume problem that a large single-celled organism will encounter. I don't have to rely on diffusion. Okay. Or I can rely on diffusion, but I don't have to rely on it going from one side of one giant cell to another. Okay. I only have to worry about each individual cell having to carry it out over a small distance. Okay, how are the cells of the leaf different from the cells found in the stem of a plant? They're specialized differently. Okay, the cells in the leaf are specialized to carry out photosynthesis and aid in the movement of water. Sorry, not in, sorry, not aid in the movement of water, but to um, control the evaporation of water. Whereas cells in the stem are designed to aid in the movement of water and nutrients. Okay. Uh, epidermis and stomates, they both control water loss. One secretes the cuticle, which prevents evaporation. The other opens and closes. Okay, and we already talked, we just talked about how the stomate works. Okay, make sure you can explain that. 